Good morning. Good to see you today. Uh, today, uh, Bo Elkington was going to uh, give the talk this morning, uh, but he was called away um, for some, uh, uh, what can I say, emergency in the family. So um, uh, I'm, I'm here instead. <laughs> um, yeah, and I, what came to my mind um, when I heard of, um, you know, Bo's situation um, is, Um, a basic uh, teaching that we have in Buddhism kind of comes from the third noble truth. Um, and um, uh, in speaking of that, that truth, uh, the Buddha mentions uh, nirvana at some point. There's various teachings here, but um, there's some mention of nirvana. And um, often I've heard it said by people. Um, in fact, this was the impression I had before I really got seriously involved in Buddhist teachings, uh, is that nirvana is kind of a Buddhist heaven something like that. And um, so where we go after we die, well, there is this option, you know, and we can go to Nirvana. Uh, and it's kind of presented like that. And um, uh, maybe not everybody goes to Nirvana, you know, we could start thinking thoughts like that. And there's probably discussions and perhaps even teachings like that. I don't know. I've never spent a lot of time looking at that. But I was curious about this word Nirvana. And just exactly is what, what, what exactly is that? And um, uh, it seemed that this meant something far different from any notions I had from my upbringing, uh, which was uh, Christian, it was Lutheran. And um, the notion of heaven, uh, this seemed to be something you couldn't just uh, <laughs> set one down on top of the other and they're kind of matching. In fact, the more I got acquainted with this term, the more um, it seemed to be something quite other than that, but what I don't know. It didn't make uh, it wasn't it wasn't clear to me for a long time. Just what is meant by that? What did the moon, uh, Buddha mean by that use of that term? It's translated sometimes like the direct translation is extinction. Extinction. And doesn't exactly fit with any notions I might have had of heaven. Um, I also came to with getting involved with Zen um, over the, over a period of time. I came to realize that this is also uh, a word that pertains to freedom, extinction, freedom. What exactly? is meant by uh, nirvana. But if we think of it as uh, something like, well, when you die, you get to go to this place, like heaven, but it's a place, it, they call it nirvana. And then supposedly, I guess, where everything will be okay, everything will be all right. And uh, we can go there. And um, as maybe some kind of reward for what I don't know. Um, but um, I mean, I'm, I'm sure there's all kinds of ideas there. And um, 
And because there was a lot of different ideas, notions, things floating around, uh, <laughs> this is part of the confusion over it, I guess, as to, you know, uh, was, was the Buddha referring to there? has connotations of extinction, it has connotations of freedom. Uh, I don't know that it necessarily has connotations of heaven or something like that. But when we put it in terms like that, like heaven or a place you can go, that kind of makes it easy to understand as long as you don't ask any more questions than that. Oh, it's a place we go to. Yeah. What kind of a place? You know, you've been, it's best we don't ask such questions because we might start coming up with answers. And uh, I can assure you any answer you might come up with is not what, this, what the Buddha was referring to. So what exactly um, is nirvana? Well, just the very idea of it being a place or a destination or an endpoint or a transition point, whatever we might be thinking, where I go, or any of us, we may go, you know, if we somehow, I guess, do things right, follow the rules and the instructions and the practice and the whatever, uh, well, this is just our ordinary thinking. We get this from all sorts of places in life. You know, going through school and on the job, on a, following a career or whatever. <laughs> Endpoints and meeting goals and going through transition points and things like that. And certainly from uh, various, various uh, religious points of view as well. But more than that, I mean, the very fact that it is so prevalent in our thinking and understanding of things in life, and what maybe we should do or must do, or when we should have done that, you know, that, all that kind of stuff. Uh, the, the, the fact that it's just there in human culture, in the human mind, it just shows that it's a, probably a very fairly normal way of looking at things. And, and, and in particular, in regard to me, you know, and here I am. And <laughs> what should I do? And if, whenever we might turn our thoughts to something like that. Of course, much of the time, we might want to just distract ourselves and not even go close to any kind of heavy thinking like that. And that's fine, too, until the uh, end of life comes uh, looming up. Not necessarily for ourselves, but even for those we might we love, and, and um, in other ways as well. Even when our pet dies, uh, we might have such our th our thoughts might turn to something like that, and it would be comforting too to think, well, yeah, but, but we'll go on to this better place doesn't have all the kind of pain and sorrow that we have here on earth in our lives. And we don't even have to worry about such things. We can just <laughs> live happily ever after or something like that, I suppose. You know, that's a comforting thought. And you know, if we get enough people around that kind of thinking in the same way, that it helps to make it a little more secure, like, well, you know, it probably really is uh, <laughs> something like this. But we're actually having, we're human beings, and we're having all the time an immediate direct experience of reality. And there's nothing in that that backs up our thinking about anything, really, but certainly not that idea that, well, we can run off to some uh, glorious and wonderful place after we die. If we play it right, otherwise we might go to some something quite opposite of that. We don't want that. Uh, and uh, that might work for the people who can buy into that and cloud it over that, you know, you really don't know this and you really don't, probably don't really deeply believe it. 
because you know better. And then there's others who read up on front. No, I don't buy that. I don't think there is any truth or any anything behind what's going on here. We die and that's it. You know. But that's still a belief, an idea that we might hold. The Buddha is identifying in that statement that he says, I'm, I haven't quite given it to you yet, but uh, what he's identifying here is that if you rely on anything at all, a word, an idea, a thought, a belief, a person, an institution, a book, a teaching, a practice, if you reach for anything at all that's going to, that you want it there to comfort you and sustain you, and maybe give you some reason for living, and, you know, and, and uh, he's back on the, what happens when I die? Uh, if, if you're relying on anything at all, including anything the Buddha says, then, or anyone else for that matter, but anything, something you conjure up, well, this just makes me feel better. Or I kind of, but at best, you're, you're going to be having something deep in the mind there that's continuously festering and disturbing you. And if you settle down, you try to settle down a little bit, enter into kind of a meditation, even if you're not really thinking about this, you can experience there's some unrest there in the mind. Maybe temporarily, it might seem kind of blissful right now, but that doesn't last. And then there's just something just unrestful about that. Well, what is it? Well, it comes from something conditional. Under these conditions, you know, if I can hang on to this, but then this would be right. This would be good. This will help me. This will calm me. This will make me understand, help me to understand, whatever. <laughs> but that situation, we haven't escaped it. And, it. and that will never bring you any kind of peace or understanding. What the Buddha pointed out when he was speaking of nirvana, he said to his monks, he said, there is the unborn, the ungrown, the unconditioned. Were there not the unborn, the ungrown, the unconditioned, there would be no escape for the born, the grown, and the conditioned. Since there is the unborn, the ungrown, the unconditioned, there is escape for the born, the grown, the conditioned. And um, I would just say this at this point, this term unborn, I'm taking this quote right out of uh, Rahula's uh, book, um, uh, What the Buddha Taught. That's the term he uses there, unborn, ungrown, unconditioned. This is reference to nirvana. And uh, this, but this term, as, as uh, Rahula has it there, unborn, ungrown, unconditioned. And I've used it for decades since I first uh, came upon that and his expression of it there. And it's a very good book too. It's very clear about many things. But I would say, I, I think still when we we're talking about unborn, ungrown, little odd, unconditioned. Well, particularly with unborn, it sounds like we're still talking about, well, there's something here that's coming now. It's, it's not, hasn't been born yet, but it's, it's coming. This is before birth, the unborn, the unborn child. It's also the unborn idea. It could, we could use it in any number of ways. But it sounds like it's, there's an anticipation here that something will be coming. And that's really not what uh, 
the Buddha's referring to there. And the ungrown too, that you know, there's something that will grow, something will flower from this, something, something's approaching and something will grow and mature and develop. And, but it hasn't happened yet. This is uh, in the future, saying it. But another problem with that is with another teaching that we have in Buddhism, is the future doesn't come. <laughs> the future isn't here. Future is the future, not now. Well, any future we have is in the idea of the future, but that's all occurring here now. But that's uh, something else again. I don't want to get into that in any detail. But um, so this unborn, ungrown, unconditioned, and of course, also unconditioned. Um, same sort of thing. It's, 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 uh, there's terms being used here that seem to be referring to things that could appear and grow and develop. And uh, this really isn't, again, uh, what the Buddha is pointing out. In fact, the Buddha is in this, whatever it was that he said in, whatever language it was, Pali, I, I don't know, but uh, it wasn't English. English wasn't even around then. But um, whatever the term was though, uh, I don't know that to say unborn, ungrown, unconditioned quite captures it. But he's more, perhaps more to the point he's referring to the non-born, non-grown, non-conditioned that these things of birth and growth and condition, conditional, also we could include death in that, doesn't apply to what it is that the Buddha is refer referring to here and that he calls um, nirvana, the term that he used. Or if it was Paul, it would be nirvana. But, um, uh, so I, I don't know about uh, these terms, un, the prefix, unborn, ungrown. Um, so I just wanted to say that. But what he's saying is that everything that we would reach for, that we think about, including ourselves or others who are dear to us, or maybe who aren't so dear, maybe who threaten us or whatever, uh, and other things, or just things and ideas and thoughts and feelings and beliefs. And all. These all exhibit birth. They come into existence, they, they're born and endure for a time and they grow and develop and change. And uh, in an, an, and under conditions. Once something is formed there and is developing changes, there is conditions, even the conditions that bring about this moment of birth are there. So uh, that, that's the connotation there. And everything that we, that we experience and know that we would reach for, that we might identify with or feel threatened by, or, it's all in these terms. This is backdrop assumption of birth and growth and conditions and all of that. And what the Buddha is pointing out then is that he's telling his monks, all well, monks, there is the non-born, non-grown, non-conditioned. Of course, even in saying is, we're pulling something now back into being here. <laughs> That's language. What the Buddha is really pointing to here, we can't even put into language because language will always put it back into these kind of uh, concrete terms, even if what we're talking about seems to be rather abstract, but still it's graspable stuff that we'll hang on to in our minds or in other ways as well. So a uh, little problem there, but maybe we can ease back by just uh, say, because like I say, if you use the term unborn, well, it's like, but it will be, it's coming. It's, you know, but there, so there's a thing there and it's not quite here yet, but it's coming. Uh, this 
isn't what the Buddha is referring to. It's not referring to something. Certainly not something that you can grasp or think or believe or take hold of. But there is something that's called just thus. Just suchness, thusness, whatever. And, uh, but, but again, words don't quite apply, but there is this way of, not a way, but it, there is this knowledge, this seeing of reality as carrying our, what well, the words all fail here, but uh, this aspect, not born, not grown, not conditioned, maybe non-born, non-grown, non-conditioned, perhaps best. And it's a matter of waking up to that. The Buddha is speaking out of his awakening, waking up to what is directly experienced here, instead of just constantly playing with and moving around the various things that we well, that we think are real and distinct and separate from me. And of course, this no, I'm formed here too. And in more than just body, we're sure we're bodily formed. Very often we, that's the first thing we'll think of when we think of myself, we think of our body or something, but then there's our mind and all the various kinds of aspects of our mind that are constantly changing, what we're thinking, what we're feeling, what we're tasting, what we're seeing, what we're hearing. It's just utter fluidity. And the same is even true of the body. Kind of from day to day, it sort of kind of looks the same, but you know, we know it is certainly over time continues to change, but also in the very fluids and the cells, you know, coming and going, living and dying and all of that, just all this change. Nothing holding still for an instant that we can ever get hold of. That's what's wrong with the term is. When, the, when that phrase where the Buddha says, there is the unborn, is there? Yeah, but again, it's not the fault of the Buddha. It's language forces us to use terms like this. Because when we're talking and speaking or writing or whatever, we're dealing with concepts and conveying ideas and understandings like that. Well, what the Buddha is referring to here is not something like that. And it's not something vague or mysterious either. There I use the analogy of so many of you have heard it so many times from me. I should find something else. But uh, with tasting the orange, I'll say tasting the strawberry, that doesn't help much. <laughs> but uh, tasting the strawberry, there's no way, I'm a language here, there's no way you're going to put this into words. Tasting the strawberry, smelling the strawberry. There's no way you're going to describe that for anyone. So that they will smell a strawberry. If they've never seen, encountered a strawberry in their life, there's no way you're going to describe it. You can't put, and even more so, more subtle than all of this is the direct experience of reality. There's no way you can put it into words such that someone else can just come along and hear what you said, read what you wrote. So, ah, oh, yeah, of course, yes. <laughs> it just simply doesn't work that way. But of course, it doesn't have to either. If it did work that way, then it's just business as usual. We're just right back to where we've always been, humankind, and wondering and you know, and wanting this and conquering that and pushing back that and blocking them. And, uh, endless. Being disturbed by all of this stuff that we do and then maybe conjuring up some kind of uh, heavenly place. And then when, when, and when Buddhist, the Buddha speaks of nibbana, nirvana, you think, oh, it must be something. But no. This is something, what's being pointed to here is something radically different, certainly from that sort of thing, but from anything you can even think. But it is not. Uh, 
vague or mysterious, no more than the taste of orange juice or the taste of strawberries. And I say, yeah, well, I, yeah, I understand. Yeah, I and mean, you might even have ideas and thoughts and you can, yeah, orange juice is kind of tangy, you know, yeah. yeah, we can say things. But never in such a way that you'll ever convey that to someone else who's never had that experience. So uh, can't be put into words. Whatever you do put into words, yeah, it might be a wonderful, beautiful, poetic description, <laughs> but it doesn't convey what it is that the attempt is to convey. So it is with what the Buddha woke up to and that any of us can wake up to because this orange juice, this strawberry, that we're talking about here, of course, it is an orange juice or a strawberry. It is reality. We're constantly experiencing it. Well, I say we, but now that's a constructed thing. But again, language kind of, a, but this is just simply thus. Is the constant experience of well, just this. Thus, what? You want me to put a word to it? No, yeah, and you probably would like that, but again, that just throws, throws it off. That's not what it is. But you do realize this. You do know this reality. That's the part that we, this, here's, here's the linchpin of the whole thing, what I'm getting to now. And most of the time, I, and I've said this many, many times in many ways, and I, I feel like you know, we just go right past what I just said. Without really look carefully at you know, what I'm pointing out here. Is that you, there's no difference between, the, between you and a Buddha. The, the perceptual experience, the immediate direct experience of this moment is no different for a Buddha, an enlightened person, an awakened person, than it is for you. This is the key to the whole thing, to realize that. They don't know something, they don't have some idea or some concept, they haven't tasted something that you haven't tasted or known or see or seen or whatever. So use kind of very poor analogies there. But there's nothing that goes on with an awakened one that you aren't already living and experiencing directly, wordlessly. Words can't even be applied to it any more than applying it to the taste of orange juice to convey that to someone else. So this is where you need to, I would say look, but you know, just, Turn your attention to just right here. What keeps us veiled from this is our thinking, is our grasping, is our believing, is our trying to bring about certain ends and hoping for this and hoping for that. Not recognizing that all such stuff as that is, these are conditional, under conditions. Dealing with things that seem to come and go born, Develop, die, fall away. Everything is like that in terms of what we would grasp or reach for. But these are the terms that we always insist on playing in. Instead of just seeing. And the just seeing is always going on. Well, the seeing anyway. The just seeing means... <laughs> Just that, you don't need all these other things, at least minimize that to a point where you realize what is actually taking place, what is actually, and of course it isn't you either, because that's also kind of a constructed, mentally constructed thing, me. But as, I said, as we go looking for the various aspects of me, it's bodily, physically, or mentally, uh, can't get hold of any one thing. There's nothing frozen there. You say, yeah, okay, and then we move on to the next thing. Slow down, look at this. 
But more than that, look at your own mind in its grasping, wanting to make sense of, uh, maybe to try to make sense of what I'm saying now, but also just in general, it makes sense of life. We'll get distracted. Well, when we see myself here, and then yeah, and I, I'm conditioned. I'm, I'm conditional <laughs> under certain conditions. I, and I will eventually die. And, and we wonder about things like that. And of course, everything else as well. You know, the Christmas holiday is coming. Ooh, and home that might throw us into a tizzy about all sorts of things, <laughs> or other holidays, or other situation all the time it's always stuff like that and we busy ourselves with trying to navigate this and do the best we can and get through it calm the waters and forge ahead even though we don't quite know maybe where we want to go yet all the while we could be just turning our attention to that busy mind that's carrying on in this way. And realize in that moment that you don't need to engage it, at least so intensely and forcefully. Either. And you just kind of just watch it. And as the things seem to come and go, they'll do this no matter what you do. You'll discover that. And you also discover that, you know, you don't really need to do that much about them. Maybe some little thing here and there in the immediate situation. That's all. Uh, to the freedom, because this term nirvana, as I said, it also has this, carries this connotation of freedom. The freedom, the freedom we're speaking of here in, in that context of nirvana is the freedom of mind. Mind is completely free to just live this moment out without fear, without anxiety, without drivenness, without overexcitement or dread, and without the lack of understanding. Because the understanding, the full knowing of reality is right there in this freedom. It's not the knowing of an object or a thought or an idea or a person. or It's not the knowing of a thing. That's always conditional. The Buddha is speaking of is non-conditional. It's immediate, direct. There is no other possibility once seen. This is it can't be otherwise. And it remains thus, even with the appearances of coming and going, because the conditions uh, don't change, you know, I mean, well, I mean, they do change, but you know, it doesn't stop. It always looks this way. There's the non-conditional aspect of it though. Always sounds this way, feels this way, looks this way. There's always birth and death, the appearances of birth and death. Birth and death without anything that's actually born, or anything that actually dies. But there's birth and death, and we can't ignore that. And growing and developing, changing. So this isn't denied or thrown away or say, well, it's nothing. It's obviously not nothing. Here it is. But it's freedom in that we don't need to be caught by it or on its terms of what well, this is just so it has to be and it has to be over here and you know, just, all this stuff that can go on with that kind of understanding of reality that it is something that this is yeah well it it is enough like that that we can't ignore it certainly it's real enough we call this small r reality. Everything I've been referring to here too, then I just kind of give a nod to it here, but this is the two truths. We don't ignore either one. There's this relative world of this and that and the coming and going. Here I am, all is all of you, 
And for each of us, we can see it in that same way. Here I am. But were it just that alone, as the Buddha said, there'd be no escape from this. But there's the unborn, ungrown, unconditioned. And since there is, now there's escape for the born, the grown. And this word escape too. Again, words force us into saying things that aren't, maybe aren't always so helpful. Because what's the escape so that, well, so that you can escape, I can escape. A Buddha has one, is one who has escaped. Well, we can look at it that way, kind of, perhaps. But that's strictly in terms of the everyday, the conventional understanding of things, where there are things. And under certain conditions, they can be arranged in various ways. Uh, yeah. yeah, and that's certainly true enough. Small, small T truth enough. Yeah. But right there in the midst of all of this, there's this aspect that is non-born, non-grown, non-conditioned. And in realizing that, waking up to that, there's suddenly freedom. It's not conditional, this freedom. It's not conditional on anything. Think about that for a moment. Were that the case? You can wake up to what is not dependent on anything. Not even on itself, whatever that thing, because it's not even a thing. Total non-conditionality. The freedom that is in that, the ease, the settledness, the wisdom, what would all that be for? Well, because we're here in this world of coming and going. And yet we can have a mind that is truly present with it and knows it, understands it, sees it, realizes it. Totally non-conditional. That's what the Buddha is pointing out here. There's nothing else like it. There's it's not even an it. But it's just simply thus. And this is not a belief. It's not a concept. It's, it's like having the concept of orange. Yeah, but that's not the taste of orange juice. You have the concept of the taste of orange juice. But then there's the knowing of the taste. Not exactly a concept. But more so. It's, there's still some problems with that, but that's just an analogy. But when it comes to this matter of totality, wholeness, just thus, there is direct knowledge of it. And it, is even, it, isn't, it isn't even knowledge that you don't have, so to speak. Only in a sense that, of course, there's nothing, we'll never locate you, but that knowledge is with it, is right here with it, in the seeing, in the realization of, just this, this non-conditionality, just simply thus. Since nothing is proposed, nothing can be torn down or argued with. People can argue with anything I might have said because I'm using words and they can be conceptualized and all of that. Yeah, no, we can argue. I won't argue with you though, because I'll apologize for not making what I'm pointing to more clear for you. But there's nothing to argue. I have nothing here to defend. And that's not the point. I'm just <laughs> trying to point out what's taking place here and what the Buddha pointed to and other great enlightened teachers have pointed to. But this is something that what I'm pointing to here is radically different from any thing else that we might do or approach. And we can work with this understanding right in the midst of this ordinary stuff of coming and going. But you have to understand that these teachings, this practice, this way, if you encounter the actual Dharma, uh, not somebody just spouting words or repeating something they've read in a book or whatever. But 
when you, you can encounter this right here and you do, and it doesn't even have to be in a form of a person who's speaking or has written something. It's just right here with the plank on the, in the floor. You know, the stone behind me, or the blueness of the sky. So that's available, always. The only thing that blocks us from this is just our own grasping mind. And uh, it's just a matter of it. And don't try to destroy that grasping mind or stop it. You can't. That, that's, that you just make it stronger. <laughs> All you need to do is notice this. And then just very gently, just back away. Uh, you can't drop everything. You, know, you have to. We're living in this world. We have bodies and take up space and we move around and we exchange ideas and thoughts. So it's not about abandoning that or throwing it away or anything, but you can use it pro properly now in the context of wholeness. Uh, instead of uh, what otherwise uh, drives this. Well, boy, I see I used up three quarters of the hour here. <laughs> I'm surprised. I better stop, maybe. I think I've said what I have to say this morning. But uh, any questions or comments or arguments? Anybody out there in Zoom land? I... Okay, well, thank you.